Welcome back. In case you're just joining us, it's time for our conversation. My guests are joining me right now. Dr. Yekachi Onoha uh, works with Connected Development. That's code. He's also a lecturer at uh, Nandi Azikri University, which happens to be my school, my alma mater. So welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Um, how is Unizik? Unizik is fine. Uh, Connected Development is doing well, too. Okay. So welcome to the program. Thank you. Dr. Bongo Adi, an economist with Lagos Business School, is joining me from Vaskai. Hello, doctor. I can see your face. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Doctor, can I see you? Um, can I really see you? We really need you to be, you know, seated. Uh, and doctor, are you still there? So that I can, yes, yes. yes. Okay, yes, doctor. Okay, we are talking about um, catalyzing inclusive economic growth today. Today, uh, yesterday, I started the series uh, looking at achieving economic growth that is inclusive in the country. But in all my research and perhaps in some of the things that I've read, uh, perhaps it would economic growth is somehow like an ambiguous term and all of that. I did ask my guest yesterday. Uh, what inclusive economic growth is. I would also ask you, because I've also realized, at least in the years of doing this, and I'm glad both of you are economists, I if, I've, if I speak to like five economists on an issue, they all have five different views, coming from five different areas. <laughs> so what's your view about inclusive economic growth? Yeah, you asking me? Yes, doctor, I'm asking you. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you very much. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting what he said about uh, economists having different perspective. Of course, economics um, is a body of knowledge, and then there are different um, areas of focus, different areas of specialization. Anyway, so inclusive economic growth is one that, in simple parlance, carries everybody along. Um, is is um, an economic growth that takes care of everyone, where the level of inequality, that is unequal distribution of income, is uh, at its minimum. Okay, so it's it's one that empowers everyone, equal opportunity, um, you know, uh, equitable uh, access to to economic opportunities and resources. So that is what. Um, uh, inclusive uh, economic growth means. I mean, uh, yeah, so we can look at it from that perspective. We can also look at it from uh, the sustainability perspective. So it is one that does not jeopardize the opportunities of uh, anyone, including the future generation. So we can be talking about intergenerational equity. We are also talking about, uh, for those who are alive at the, at the same point in time, that they have equal opportunity, they have equal access to the resources. So resources are equitably and justifiably distributed. Mm. Okay, l l let, let me come back to Dr. Noha here uh, in the studio, because like you said, it's economic growth or inclusion should uh, carry everybody along equal. But from what Dr. Bongo said there in Lagos, can you really have equal opportunities to everyone since they say f f not all fingers are, all the five fingers are not equal? So how can you achieve that equitability in an economy and you're trying to promote inclusion? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because Absolutely. yesterday we are, we, uh, I asked, talk about the question, if we can indeed get inclusion for people that are not in uh, production generating sector, or sectors of the economy. I hope you understand what I mean. Okay, so yes. I, I, it's all about creating that fairness. Okay. And so uh, you may not have exactly equal opportunities, but look at it this way. When you actually make sure that growth goes to all sectors of individuals and people in various places, so that if Taiwo in uh, Ondo State and uh, Halia in Kaduna, a former in Onesha, Aban in Uyo, we give them this same form of sense of belonging to a country where we have resources. These resources, how are they distributed to people? Do we look at issues affecting the vulnerable groups? Do we look at issues affecting women? 
So, for example, you want to give political opportunities to both gender, and then we are in a country where parties have their meetings in the night. So it means you've not provided a platform for women also, also to participate. So women are not expected particularly to attend such meetings in the night. So you create a platform where they can also play. If you want to say, okay, let's do gender inclusion. In doing gender inclusion, there should be that room for all people to actively be part of income generation, to be part of provisions for political opportunities, economic opportunities, and indeed cultural opportunities, which to a, a large extent we see it's, uh, it's, it's lacking. A as a matter of fact, there are a lot of people who are disabled in, in our space. How do you take care of them? So creating opportunity for everyone, equal opportunity for everyone, it's achievable by creating some of those platforms that, that will make them to thrive at so their own So are level. you saying that economic growth can be balanced in a manner that it would involve everyone, but not, it might not be at the same level? Absolutely. It's particularly difficult to get at the same level, but what efforts have we made to make sure that we create that fairness? When we talk about equity, we are r talking about fairness. We create fairness for everyone so that people can participate at any level and have opportunities to do what they need to do. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dr. Bongo, if you're still with me there in Lagos, uh, speak to us why you think um, an inclusive economic growth is so important at this time. Because last week, when I was doing the show last week, uh, it, it popped up in my mind and I did pencil it down. I told my team, let's take a look at it for the first three days of this week. For example, Nigeria is struggling with a, an economic growth of 2%. Our population is growing over that rate. Women are giving birth every day. You can imagine how many babies or newborns we have at this morning. So why is inclusive economic growth so important for us? Inclusive. Well, like, as, as I said, um, uh, you know, um, inclusive growth is, um, you know, a rising tide that buoys every boat. So it carries everybody along. Now, that is very important because uh, what we're talking about here is about living standard, about uh, livelihood systems, livelihood dynamics. Now, we are talking about income distribution. Now, okay, it's a stylized fact in, in development economics that when you have very high level of inequality, it creates a lot of uh, social um, uh, problems, um, social upheaval, uh, you know. Inequality um, damages growth, is inimical to economic development. So you cannot achieve economic development when you have high levels of inequality as we have in Nigeria today. Now, uh, in the early days of the study of uh, inequality, there is something economics call the Kuznets curve. Now, um, it used to be uh, um, referred essentially to Latin America, you know, when you run a regression analysis on, uh, on uh, um, you know, cross-country growth, uh, you know, so you notice that the Latin countries, Latin American countries tend to have a very high level of inequality which stems from their history, the colonial past. But today we have taken over the Latin countries uh, by having you know, um, a higher level of inequality in the distribution of wealth in Nigeria. So you have so many people who have no access, poverty level, uh, Nigeria is now the poverty capital of the world. And we know that poverty, um, you know, when poverty intensifies, inequality also um, goes with it. So we have a system where if you measure inequality using, sorry if I bring in this, Gini coefficient, which is the uh, metric or the statistics that economics use to measure inequality. So it goes from zero to one. If it is zero, it means that resources are equitably distributed, that people have equal um, you know, size of the cake. But if it goes closer to one or one, it means that uh, one individual controls everything. So on the scale of zero to one, inequality in Nigeria is above five, it's about six. 
which tells you that it is um, unsustainably very high. Now, Oxfam published a report in 2017, which shows that only 2% of Nigerians, okay, have all the bank accounts in the financial system, in the banking system. That tells you that inequality is exceedingly, you know, high in Nigeria. So what is the implication of that? Of course, we don't need to think harder. We don't need to look any further to find the uh, consequences of having very high inequality in our system today. You know, so we are terrorized at every front. Um, we have social disturbances. Uh, we have high levels of violent crimes all over. So all these things are associated with very high level of inequality. Now, we cannot also achieve growth as we want, like you mentioned. So our population is a seat, our population growth rate exceeds the growth rate of the economy. And this has been ongoing uh, since we came out of the recession, you know, in 2016. So we have a higher growing population relative to economic expansion. Okay. So it means that we are not able to provide for even the, the uh, you know, citizens of the country um, resources to sustain them. So okay. this is a sitting time bomb, uh, you know, so it is um, an ill wind that will not blow the country any good. Mm. You, you say it's a sitting time bomb, but already, I'm, I'm, for me, from my own analysis, it's exploded already. We're seeing the po pockets of explosion, except we are not telling ourselves the truth. And like I always say on the program, it's better for us to tell ourselves the truth because nobody will tell it to us and we need to attack that situation squarely. It's already exploding, <laughs> pockets and pockets of insecurity. However, people want to, well, whatever shade, banditry or whatever, but it's criminality, it's terrorism, it's unemployment, uh, the symptom coming out uh, and all of that. Uh, but, but, but let me still stick with you a bit. I'll come back to uh, Dr. Ono Haine Beats. Do you think that the groundwork is being laid for uh, to catalyze inclusive economic growth right now. The groundwork in the sense that this administration, for example, would say, oh, okay, we're trying to bring out a lot of people out of poverty. Uh, the president's speech on June 12, 2019, he did say uh, that it is their intention to pull out 100 million people out of poverty in the next 10 years. There's a conditional cash transfer. There's the school feeding program that is also a chain, not just feeding the children, but along that value chain, uh, sustaining people that are producing eggs, farming, even the women selling the food and all of that. Do you see that as sufficient enough to catalyze the economy inclusion, inclusion in the country? Um, well, I think I have to be very, um, <laughs> You know, I have to be categorically here to tell you that it is insufficient, actually, because um, what, what you have recounted, all the strategies and the policies government um, have been pursuing, those are social programs, uh, conditional cash transfer, school feeding, and all of that. So those are temporary palliatives, okay? Um, they are not actually sustainable. They are not long-lasting solutions to the problem of uh, inequality and inclusive growth. Now, w we can cite examples, uh, even in Latin America, where, the, you know, where this conditional cash transfer thing started um, a, a decade or so ago, uh, through programs like Progressa um, in, in, in Mexico and, and all of that. Now, did it achieve the aim? Of course not. So, um, and then we, we are embarking on all those things. You see, when it comes to growth, when it comes to poverty alleviation, when it comes to inclusive growth, the only thing that makes it happen is economic growth. Now, uh, people may have their own um, views about um, what can lead to inclusive growth. The fire remains is that, is that when the economy is growing, supposing that we have about 7% of growth, okay? Yeah, we've also have had that in the past because uh, between 20... 2010, or let's say yeah. 2008 to 2014, the economy grew at an average of 6%, 6 you know? So if we had sustained that growth, of course, we, you know, if you look at it, it means that it will take us about uh, in less than 10 years for per capita income to double. That is if we had 
um, sustain the growth rate of 6%. So in less than 10%, in less than a decade, our per capita income would have um, doubled. Now, the truth of the matter is that when growth, uh, when you begin to have um, significant growth in an economy, it doesn't begin to filter down to every Dick and Harry at the same time. So it takes some time. You know, I can give some uh, examples, for instance. If growth happens, it's usually driven by some sectors. There was a time in Nigeria where the fastest growing sector was the oil and gas, and then the telecommunication, the banking system, and the financial services. Now, those sectors will begin to grow and begin to mop up a lot of capital. But over time, that growth will begin to filter down to the other sectors of the economy so that people, more and more people get into that growth spot. Now, that is what normally happens. So I am of the school of thought that the only thing that can create equitable growth in Nigeria is for us to have sustainable long-term economic growth. Now, do we have the fundamentals to achieve that um, in the current uh, uh, regime? I, I can tell you that, well, it is not yet clear. Okay, so let, let's start from education, which is the core thing that drives, gives people opportunity to really compete in an economy in order to improve their, uh, their, their, life, their living standards and their livelihood. Now, we have significant number of out of school children all over Nigeria. And then we have the problem of education. Then there some people have also leveled our educational system today as a sitting time bomb because we are not equipping the young people with the appropriate level of skill that they need to compete in the generation, the new world order in which we are. So we are very uncompetitive. We are not so productive. The human capital in Nigeria is not productive relative to other African countries. So when we are not even competitive in Africa, at African standards, then that is a very big problem. So it means that we are not preparing for the future. We are not providing the basic uh, requirement, the requisites, uh, preparations uh, re needed for the young people, for our generation, uh, for, for our citizens to be competitive in the future. So meaning that we will have an intensification of inequality. Think about the number of children who are out of school in the northern part of uh, the country. Think about the problem that we have in our educational system because people are not getting the right skill. They are not uh, uh, getting the competence, the right competency level to really be competitive. Okay. So over time, we, will, we expect that um, you know, uh, the problems of inclusive growth will continue to intensify, except that the right things are done at okay. this point in time. Okay, we'll come to the right things in a bit. Uh, uh, we'll come to the right things in a bit. And I'm just looking at my, my clock here in the studio. Now, Dr. Ono, you, you've heard what he said. He's raised up some issues. He, he was so categorical when I asked him the question, if the groundwork is being laid, he said no. Uh, even with the social intervention programs. The social intervention programs, I think, from this administration is to perhaps minimize, you know, the mark of poverty on the poorest of the poor. Um, but he also said that it's not even, uh, you know, th the way out. If we take a look at even some other countries where you've seen social interventions, which he mentioned, I think, Mexico, uh, I think also in Brazil, uh, where we, I think it's still on Bolsa Familia, the kind of conditional cash transfer program uh, that they have in, in, in Brazil. If you take a look at all those things, it's still not giving us the impact which we want it to give. He also mentioned jobs being created. Um, I think according to our GDP, we have about 45 sectors. Yeah. Uh, for That's the ranking, the GDP. And just about Perhaps three sectors are just, you know, there, you know. How do we maximize other sectors to create inclusion, to promote economic growth that will create inclusion? Okay, so first of all, let me categorically say that social intervention programs are actually meant to cushion the effect of mm. a problem. So in Nigeria, we have not actually addressed the key problem we've had. So if you ask an average Nigeria, what is the key problem we have in this country? Somebody could say it's insecurity. Somebody could actually say it's unemployment. Somebody could say it's poverty. It's uh, problems in the health sector. But if you ask me, I say no, they're not. They're not the key issues. So we have missed it. It's strategic leadership that we need in this mm -hmm. country. 
and we have not had it. It's not about the present government alone. It's also about all the previous governments we have had in this country. And so what's the challenge? Let's analyze from a microeconomic perspective. So as an individual, I have a household. So perhaps I have uh, two kids, and I am progressing towards having other ones. Move it up to four, five, six, seven, and who knows, ten. And my income for the household is not increasing with the same way that my household number increased. It means that over a period of time, I will not be able to take care of the family. And you remember the society is a product of the family. And so if I'm unable to take care of that family, it means that perhaps you are going to produce people who become wayward in the society. So look at it. Look at Nigeria now. So Nigeria has given birth to over 200 million people. And then we tend towards budgeting for consumption more than we budget for production, more than we budget for industrialization in this country. And we are likely to have bigger challenges. At the microeconomic level, at some point, your income will now become exactly equal to your consumption. That means you have nothing to save and nothing to invest. And so you may go out to borrow money to sustain the household. So translate it to what we have in the country. Look at the 2020 budget. When it was appropriation bill that entered National Assembly, at some point, we discovered that we had around 2.1 trillion naira going for capital expenditure. Compare that with the, uh, the expenditure figure of 10 point something trillion. And so if you look at that, you see we have only less than 20% going into capital expenditure. And every other thing goes into consumption, consumption. So at this point, is it that Nigerians have not thought about having a population control as it should be? This ought to have happened at periods when we had over 100 million, and now we are talking about over 200 million. So the population is going to be a challenge because we don't have an economy to drive mm. this population. Uh. And how, how would it be for us that United Nations says in 2050, that's your projection, Nigeria will be the third, third largest, largest population mm. in, the world. in the world. With 450 million people with the, with the current progression. So we are going to have a very big problem and people are not thinking about it. Okay, you, you raised some issues and let me stick with you a bit. You raised that education might not be the issue, health might not be the issue, but the leadership question is the issue. That also came out yesterday while I was discussing with my guest, and I said that would be a topic for another day because <laughs> if we need to x-ray it, you know, leadership, we can't finish it on one edition of the program. But just touch on it a bit. Why you said that leadership, leadership is essential, not all those things we're saying. Okay, so let me come from this perspective. You see, leadership is critical in every economy. So... When we say we have issue of unemployment, where did it come from? We have a government that talks about cushioning the effect of everything. So at the moment, we are cushioning the effect of insecurity. We are not actually solving the problem of insecurity. At the moment, we are cushioning the effect of poverty and all that. And people wallow in punery because the leaders have not been strategic enough to put the right things in place. Give an average Nigerian visa to leave this country. Ah. You, you discover that many people are willing to go. And when they go out there, they work more than the way they work in Nigeria. Why is that so? It is so because the government has not provided sufficient enabling environment for these people to thrive. Look at the area of industrialization. So look at the steel industry we've had. Before I was born, it was under construction. At my age, it's still under construction. And we have not actually stepped up. We need a leadership that will stir up industrialization. We need leadership that can make us move to where we ought to be. And I think we also need a population control. Mm -hmm. In this country, well, uh, one of our leaders came to National Assembly 
And then it categorically told us that four of his women have produced 27 children. He, he did not say they have given birth. He said they have produced by implication, ma manufactured. Look at issues of inequality against women. And so an average Nigerian will say, oh, that is fine. Why won't I give birth to 20? Why won't I give birth oh, to they 30? They say, if I have the resources, I can yeah. give birth to as many as we I want. We are not even looking at resources. Sometimes, because of religious inclinations, mm -hmm. we say, let's give birth to as much as we can, so that God will take care of them. Just, of just them. continue. Okay. And, so, and so that's part of a big problem we have in this country. There is need for population control before we even start driving the economy. China did it uh, sometime, established population control, and waited the for... Policy. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't have a particular amount, you're not qualified to have a second child. So uh, over time, the population started driving the economy. So they, they relaxed it a little more. So we ought to have been uh, having population control as <laughs> early as 10 years back. Okay. Yeah. That's a topic for another day. Some people may not be happy with that population control uh, issue you're bringing up. But perhaps those are some kind of honest discussions we also need yeah. to look at and x-ray on the program. Uh, Dr. Bongo, if you're still with us there, um, we're moving over to creating enabling business environment that would catalyze economic growth. Yesterday, I did also ask my guest the power of 200 million people. He did, he's coming from the view that we have to control our population. But the way it is going right now, population growth can also be an asset or a liability. The way it is right now is turning to a liability because most of us are not at work. A lot of us are unemployed and a lot of us are poor. Um, how do you think that Nigeria can be a people uh yes yes how do you think that nigeria can be a people and a money magnet let me put it that way i hope you understand what i mean how do you think that the nigerian economic space can be a people and a money magnet in the terms of attract the right people even if we have 200 million people in terms of foreign direct investment and in terms of m magneting money in terms of capital inflows that's the direction of my question Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I get your point. Um, uh, let me speak a little to the issue of uh, population control and all of that. Um, I do not think that our problem um, is about the population. Yes, um, economists will always tell you that um, population is uh, deleterious to economic growth. When you have uh, more people relative to capital relative to the industry, industrial assets that you have, then um, that would uh, limit the growth that you could uh, generate from such. But um, we've also seen countries that are large and been able to, they've managed to grow their economy. Um, yesterday, I had a conversation also where this came up and, and, and uh, you know, just like my colleague on this, in the studio said, Okay, it was also uh, what uh, the other colleague said, that uh, we need to control the population. But my, my issue here is on productivity. Now, the population is not productive. It doesn't matter how many people there are. So if you cut off, uh, say, half of Nigerian population as it is today, will they still be productive? They will still not be productive. Total factor of productivity, by the way, in, in Nigeria is the lowest in Africa. So we have become the most uncompetitive economy. It is unfortunate that we have to reel out all these dismal statistics about us all the time. Nobody likes hearing very negative things about himself or herself. But unfortunately, that's where we find ourselves. We wish there could be something positive that we could say. But that's what the statistics gives us. So even within Africa, we are now beginning to come last on everything. So when you come to what is called the economic co you know, complexity, complexity index, we are the most undiversified, we are the most unproductive. So what the first thing is, before you are able to be, if, if, before, before becoming a magnet to attract investment, you have to look at your own potentials, you know, your productivity potentials. So who would bring investment here if your labor, labor force, your human capital is not up there 
is not competitive. Who is going to bring um, his uh, factory, set up factory in Nigeria, where you have uh, problems along, you know, uh, all the value chain points? Okay, uh, you have problem with the human capital, which is the social infrastructure. You have the problem with uh, physical infrastructure. You have problem with transportation. You have problem with energy. So when it comes to infrastructure, we have all manner of problems. Yes, with um, my colleague mentioned, you know, the capital budget, uh, which is uh, relatively small uh, compared to the, um, you know, the recurrent expenditure. Okay, but again, it is important also to realize that the human capital is also part of what the recurrent expenditure is used to cater for. So we cannot say that uh, recurrent expenditure is 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 not uh, important. It's, it's extremely important. People have to eat. Uh, people have to be healthy, so because it's from the salaries and wages that workers are paid that they're able to build human capital. So human capital is essential, uh, a, a very important input to the production process. So, okay. the Dr. Wongo, are you still there? Oh, okay, the network again. But let me come to uh, Dr. Noha because we just have mm -hmm. a few minutes to end the program. He was of the view. Population is not a problem, is, is productivity, you know. Um, but le le let's, let's, let's move a bit from that and come to the aspect of perhaps what government is doing. Because if I, if, uh, if I can imagine government watching this program, like, okay, Nancy, don't you know what we're doing in transportation? The railway lines are working right now. We are trying to resuscitate them. Power, we are trying to reform the sector. We are giving power sector money. Uh, what is happening in education and all of they can reel out all those to me, but is, are those things enough? Just very quickly. As okay, we move. okay. So we need to look at areas concerning cost of governance, cost of governance, and lots of money we lose in areas of the extractives. Okay, so look at the budget again. You discover that the amount that was sent into National Assembly as part of the appropriation bill for 2020 was 125 billion. And then the basic uh, health care provision fund, which is 1% of the consolidated revenue fund, was around 40, 44 billion. Now, there are people who die away in rural communities do, who do not have health care facilities provided for them. And then we have an economy where people actually enjoy d traveling out to have health care provisions for them when indeed we can resuscitate our health care system here. The cost of governance seems to be very high. So the money that should have been used to equip the educational sector, the money that should have been used to equip the health care sector, it's, it's used to run governance. And if you ask me, it's, it's way too high. It needs to be cut down so that we can now start balancing this economy we have. So how do we invest in industrialization? How do we invest in production? How do we subsidize production? How do we make places where de there has been trickles of activity? For example, Nebu should have been the hub of uh, industrial activity in Africa. How do we put in money? into that kind of sector to drive the economy. So perhaps putting money into production, take away the full subsidy? Exactly. Because you talk about subsidy. Exactly. Subsidized production. Subsidized production and not consumption. Because what we've been doing is to subsidize consumption and we leave out production. I tell you one thing, there, there's a, a, a program we are running with Oxfam, Conflict and Fragility Pro uh, Project. You will discover that uh, there are lots of companies in Nigeria operating without being legally registered. So we need to cover the loopholes. There are lots of loopholes we see in the extractive industry, okay. in the oil and gas sector. And the kind of money we lose on a daily basis is far beyond 200,000 million uh, barrels. Okay, okay, I think, I think we'll leave it at that yeah. because we have to go. But let's just quickly take these comments coming in from Twitter. Um, okay. I'll just take this. Not in a country on Twitter says, good morning, Nancy. Human capital development seems to be a joke in Nigeria. The leaders have continued to fail the society in this regard. Wakem Shera says, uh, see how smart and right 
on the money your guests sound so intelligent and abreast with the issues at hand i won't read the, the rest but he's talking about our leadership process that we are not yet ready so thank you very much for being on the program today dr onoha